tonight's speaker. Thomas Denenberg is the curator, is excuse me, the director of the Shelburne Museum. Prior to moving to Vermont in 2011, he served as the chief curator and deputy director of the Portland Museum of Art in Portland, Maine, curator of American art at Reynolda House, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and curator of American decorative arts at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. Tom received a BA in history from Bates College and earned his MA and PhD in American Studies from Boston University. He has held fellowships at the Smithsonian Institution and Winter Tour and taught undergraduates and graduate students at Boston University, Harvard, and Wake Forest. He's the author of a number of books on the Wyatt family, but he said, I didn't have to read all the rest of that, and just <laughs> get going. So please help me welcome Tom Denver. This is a delightfully sensitive microphone I have on. So I apologize for any squeaks and gurgles um, that may go on. Um, but let me know if you can or can't hear me at any time. Um, good, good. I'm glad that that works well. Um, and I love the title of, did you say the drowsy chaperone? Um, I have young children, so I think I am the drowsy chaperone. Half the time we're involved in museums or public sphere events. Um, so thank you so much. I get a tremendous kick out of um, gathering to talk about the Wyatts. Um, and, uh, and I'm so pleased that so many of you came out um, tonight, because this is, this is a good, fun, fun talk. And I'm pleased, pleased to see you all um, tonight. So if I was to ask you the most famous painting in American visual culture, you would answer? I think we're done here. Um, so depending on where you are geographically, I will say. Anyone from Chicago here? Anyone from the West? Of course not. Good. Uh, if we ask that question in Chicago, we get American Gothic, probably. Um, but for the most part, depending how the question is asked uh, in this country, um, Christina's world looms large in our um, you know, thinking about the easel tra tradition in the 20th century. Um, it's obviously uh, at home. The Museum of Modern Art um, it was uh, painted by uh, Andrew Wyatt in 1948. Um, it was quite controversial, controversial when MoMA acquired it in that time period because this was not part of the program of the Museum of Modern Art um, in uh, the 1950s when it was acquired. Of course, in the years immediately after World War II, the received wisdom about American painting, American visual culture, is that we are on a moving sidewalk toward abstraction, pure abstraction, and something like this seemed like it was coming from you know, a, a different century, you know, literally. Um, in the case of, uh, of what we, what we, we, where we thought we were going in, in the art world. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a little stake in the ground here uh, as we talk about um, the Wilds, um, because it is, of course, you know, one of the most uh, well-known and well easily recognized of all paintings um, that we have uh, in our country. And it's, it's a stake in the ground for this conversation tonight, for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, because what I want to... Um, talk about with you, and at the end we can have a little Q&A um, and discuss any trouble I get into in the course of the evening. What I want to talk about is the fact that all three generations of the Wyeth family, um, N.C. Wyeth, Newell Converse Wyeth, Andrew Wyeth, and grandson, son and grandson Jamie Wyeth, um, all display a penchant for exploring extreme perspective uh, in their painting, in their uh, practice. And by extreme perspective, I mean when you look at the Wyatts, any of the Wyatts, um, from the early 20th century until very recently, um, in the case of Jamie, you'll notice that you're always looking up or looking down. You're always at the bird's eye view, the worm's eye view. Um, and this is very important to us at Shelburne Museum, um, because of course, as many of you know, we are the stewards of soaring, which is Andrew Wyatt's um, great, great paintings. Um, and we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, but the fact that Shelburne Museum um, owns Soaring and has um, since 1960 it is really the impetus for this talk. Um, because some years back, I was uh, talking with a woman uh, discussing the painting, Soaring, with a woman named Joyce Hill Stoner, 
who's a conservator, and she's made her, her practice her whole life working with the Wyatt um, family, and we'll talk about that uh, a little more in depth. Um, and we were standing in front of Soaring, um, and, uh, and I, I just happened to say, it's, it's kind of dizzying, isn't it? And I sort of did this kind of gesture, you know, rolling, rocking back on my heels. And she rocked back on her heels, too, and she said, well, yeah, all the good Wyatts are a little um, dizzying. And, and then she looked at me and she said, and the Wyatts themselves are a little dizzying, too, aren't they? Um, and so we did an exhibition a few years ago, I think some of you may have seen, called Wyatt Vertigo, um, where we decided that this vertiginous perspective that all three Wyatts employ for much of the 20th century is really inherent and very important um, to understanding the authority of the work and why um, it was so uh, popular in uh, the course of the 20th century. So from Christina's world, what I'd like to do is take us back a little bit um, and talk about um, N.C. Wyatt, Newell Converse Wyatt, who was born in 1882 um, and died in a rather awkward circumstances um, in 1945, right at the end of World War II, in a car, car accident, um, sadly with his grandson um, in the car um, with him. But N.C. Wyeth, uh, as many of us will recall from our, our parents' and grandparents' libraries and generation, was the most popular illustrator in this country, in the 20th century. Um, I did grab these off my shelf. Um, I'm sure many of you will recognize the very standard Scribner's Illustrated editions of James Fenimore Cooper's Dear Slayer, um, with illustrations by N.C. Wyeth, and papers. If librarians in the room don't hold books like this, um, end papers begin kind of giving us a hint at the uh, the perspective that we're talking about, the worm's eye view um, of the uh, the Mohicans here. But what I wanted to do was actually focus on a, a plate out of David Balfour by Stevenson, Tam on the Craig Face by N.C. Wyatt, because I think that really. Um, is a good way of starting this conversation about N.C. Wyeth and the fact that N.C. Wyeth, uh, as an illustrator and as a teacher, was a master at moving your eye around a fairly small uh, plate in a book. So I'm going to guess this is what, 8 by 10 inches or something like that? So the plate in here is probably not 6 by 8, but there is a great deal of information on this plate. Now, we have all grown up in recent years in a visual culture where we're very used to getting information in film and screens and television and now even our phones, but we forget that in 1925 or 26, when this was published, that this was about the most exciting thing you're going to see short of going to the movies. Um, so N.C. Wyatt's ability to capture your eye and lead you through a narrative in the course of this page is masterful. Um, there is a theorist uh, named Bart or Benjamin who writes about punctum. So, Bart, thank you very much, Roland Bart. We've got a ringer in the room. Roland Bart, um, who has this concept of the punctum or the punctuation mark, where there is always that one point on the page where your eye is drawn to the point and then the entire image unfolds, the narrative of the image unfolds out um, from that one, um, that one point. And I think we want to understand how. Uh, sophisticated N.C. Wyatt's uh, talent and ability was when it comes to drawing that, um, that narrative. So here he is, about 1910, in his studio um, near Chad's Ford, um, Pennsylvania, with a painting called um, The Upper Snow Platform um, on the Easel. And that was a painting we had in Wyatt Vertigo. Um, so it was a painting that we got to know, those of us who um, come to uh, uh, come to the exhibition. As I mentioned, Last of the Mohicans by Cooper, um, Wyatt really became the person uh, who translated uh, these uh, 19th century works into 20th century uh, modern um, visual culture. Um, here again, the, the, the cover of The Last of the Mohicans is a fairly straight on view, um, but so many of the other plates in these books uh, employed this dizzying um, perspective that you see here, and then right to those end papers of The Deer Slayer. Um, that we just uh, saw um, saw here. Uh, I, again, I would ask you to kind of suspend um, your experience of the last decades and 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 roll back, um, uh, you know, roll back to a moment where illustrations in popular magazines, where illustrations in relatively inexpensive books, um, were some of the most exciting. 
uh, ways of understanding literature in this country, where something like um, N.C. Wyeth's illustrations are roughly akin to what we get on websites today, in terms of the almost you know, titillization or titillizing aspect of um, of these images that we that we see. Prior to this generation, if we saw an illustration in a book, it would have been a black and white um, um, uh, sort of line uh, drawing. It wouldn't have had nearly the kind of interest or authority um, that Wyeth's works um, had. Um, that you um, that you um, that you see here. Now Wyeth um, had a um, little bit of a chip on his shoulder. Um, he was known as an illustrator. Um, he was uh, renowned as an illustrator. He was a, a teacher. Um, students would travel to uh, to study uh, under him. Um, but he really wanted to be known as an artist. Um, and the kind of storied battles around. Um, the concept of modern art at the turn of the century, modern photography, modern art, this, this ideal of the modern art and the way in which um, artists um, kind of performed a personality in society. If I was to ask you all to close your eyes and just come up with an image in your mind's eye of what an artist looks like, that person would look like. Actually, I'll, I'll sharpen it a little bit. He would look like. <laughs> He would be wearing a beret. He would be wearing black. He would be in a studio. He would look a little bit like N.C. Wyeth at that easel. There, there's kind of this macho persona of the artist that gets played out in society in the late 19th um, and early 20th century. And to be a commercial illustrator means you're kind of, you know, a mechanic. <laughs> You're a you're a tradesperson. You're not an artist. You're not in the Tenth Street studio in Manhattan. You're not you're not sort of um, being reviewed by um, critics. Um, and the you know the rise of art criticism in the late nineteenth century is part and parcel of this. Um, you know, once you have artists, you have to have critics. Once you have critics, you have to have artists, and it's this kind of closed loop um, between them. Um, so, N. C. Wyatt had this this chip on his shoulder um, that he wanted to be a, a landscape painter rather than illustrating um, these books. And then as now, um, one of the places you would go um, to, um, uh, to be taken seriously uh, as, a, as an artist, as a painter, was the great state of Maine. Um, Maine plays a slightly outsized role in the landscape of uh, American um, visual culture. And a lot of it has to do with um, the, um, the sort of accident, if you will, the happy accident, the Winslow Homer. Um, landed at Prout's Neck, Maine, just below um, Portland. Um, Maine, of course, had been a place where Frederick Church and so many other landscape painters had traveled to in the course of the 19th century, but, but not really terribly different from going and painting Niagara Falls, not terribly different from the local painters Hope and Heidi painting the mountains of Vermont, not terribly different from the kind of circuit that painters would have gone on to capture uh, the natural wonders of the United States at mid-century. So you'd go paint the Natural Bridge of Virginia, you'd go paint the Hudson River, you'd go paint Niagara Falls. So there's, there's kind of a, a, a loop that you would paint on if you wanted to be taken seriously. Um, by the time of Winslow Homer's death, though, in um, 1910, and he was born in 1836 and he dies in 1910, by the time of his death, if you really want to be taken seriously as a painter, you go to Maine. Um, and Homer became the father figure and even the grandfather figure to the next generation of modernists, of modern painters, Rockwell, Kent, and so many others, um, who went uh, to Maine really to measure themselves against um, Homer. Um, this is N.C. Wyeth right on the eve of um, World War II, um, and he's painting a, a lobster fisherman um, leaning out of a dory. Um, has anyone been fishing out of a dory ever. Um, this is a kind of awkward stance he's in um, right now. Um, even though that's a very stable little vessel, um, that's, you know, you know you're, you're as likely as not, if you were a landlubber like me, to end up in, in the drink. Um, but this is called Deep Cove Lobsterman. It's from the collection of the Pennsylvania Academy um, from 1938. Um, and I think it doesn't take a very elaborate imagination to understand N.C. Wyeth's debt to Winslow Homer. This is Winslow Homer lost on the Grand Banks from 1886. Um, I'll try not to give you vertical, vertigo toggling back and forth, but you can see uh, exactly what, um, 
um, you know, where, where um, Wyatt is coming from in his homage um, to, uh, to uh, Homer. Um, I think it pays, it will, it will pay if we kind of draw out the comparison for a few moments here. Um, Winslow Homer was also a commercial artist. Um, those of you who know his biography, hi. Um, who know his biography, uh, remember that uh, he apprenticed at a lithographer's in um, uh, Boston on the eve of the Civil War, and he went off to the front um, in the Civil War as an embedded reporter, to use a, a contemporary um, term, a sketch artist. And he would send his uh, sketches um, back to illustrated newspapers in New York, and they would be um, engraved by mostly German engravers, um, and then they would appear in the popular, the popular press um, of the era. We spend a lot of time today talking about the toll of combat, uh, the psychological toll of combat um, on soldiers. Um, there really wasn't much room for that conversation, that discussion um, during the Civil War. You had religion, you had you know, the, the glory of the state, you had you know, all these kind of reasons why you went to war. But we, I think, have underplayed the fact that um, the Civil War was the most horrific bloodletting anyone had seen uh, in probably Western history, um, and the toll that it took on the individuals uh, who, who fought that war. And it comes down and crystallizes, I think, in the biography of Winslow Homer. He came back from the front uh, in 1862, and his mother wrote a letter to a family friend saying, Winslow is so changed, his best friends don't recognize him. So he came back from the front basically suffering from what today we would call post-traumatic stress um, disorder. He himself wrote a series of letters where he sketched looking through a sniper's um, scope on a rifle and said, it's as close to murder as anything I've ever seen. It gave me shivers, etc., etc. So by 1863, he is already looking for other uh, outlets of expression for what he's seen, and he turns to painting. Uh, he executes a series of paintings of the war, of camp scenes, very enigmatic um, paintings, which that's subject of another whole discussion we can do some night. Um, and by 1870, after the war, um, those of you who know his work, he is um, very focused on these um, pastoral scenes, bucolic scenes, scenes of farm life, of children, of regeneration after the war, children, farming, crops. If you think about the great painting of the Met Veteran in a New Field from 1866, this is all about you know, what, what comes next after the war. Um, throughout the course of Homer's lifetime, until we get to the uh, uh, you know, turn of the century, um, he moves through painting in mountains, he gets to the coast. At a certain point when he's painting the coast, the figures recede and all you get are waves flashing rocks, things that are very primal, very constant, very natural. Um, and so much of that has to do with his experience um, during, uh, during the Civil War. So that was a long-winded little passage in sidebar to point out that Winslow Homer also had a journey from being a commercial artist, a lithographer's apprentice, and a sketch artist, um, to being taken seriously as one of the most important painters in the country. Interestingly enough, um, a good friend of mine, Margie Conrads, wrote a book called Winslow Homer and the Critics, and points out that Homer achieved a degree of financial success and even critical, critical success at each moment in his career. Um, critics occasionally <laughs> chastised him, saying, Mr. Homer is not finishing his paintings, um, by that meaning that he's working in a very brushy, and brushy style. But for the most part, it's fairly unusual for an artist to move all the way through their career in these different phases and achieve the renown he does. So much so that by the time he moves to Prout's Neck, 1883-1884, um, he's very well established and very well regarded. And by the time he dies in 1910, he is something of a legendary figure. And other artists move to Maine and measure themselves against his experience. Homer himself lived about 185 feet from high tide at Prout's Neck in a little building. Um, and so he was you know, the artist who was so focused on his muse that he eschewed all kind of worldly uh, pleasures um, and lived in that little studio and painted. Did not marry. Um, there was a hotel nearby. If he got hungry, he would fly what he called the lunch flag. 
and someone would bring him something to eat. Um, so, you know, literally, literally achieved a kind of monk-like um, existence. 1884, he appears in a newspaper um, that actually calls him the Hermit of Proud's Neck. Um, we can also put that aside because I think it's rare that hermits appear in newspapers. So I think he was fairly self-conscious in his ability to portray, um, you know, portray that um, that image. But nonetheless, you know, Homer is kind of the archetype. Um, I bring all this up because N.C. Wyeth moves to Maine, buys a house, and names it for a Homer painting called Eight Bells. Um, so N.C. Wyeth was clearly moving to Maine to emulate the experience of Winslow um, Homer. This is Dark Harbor Fisherman from N.C. Wyeth um, from 1943. Um, and here again, extreme perspective. We're looking down from the dock, presumably. Um, we can see these fishermen in the dory. There's a little punt in the back of these different, different boats. And they're, they're moving bait fish around um, in, these, uh, uh, in these little uh, vessels. Um, uh, basically, it's sort of the, the chapter before the, the painting we just saw where he's putting the bait into the, into the lobster pot. Um, um, this is at the Portland Museum of Art. Have people seen this painting? Um, th this is where I can't stand showing slides. Um, I came of age where we weren't supposed to talk about things like genius when you're looking at paintings or talk about emotional response. But this is one of those paintings where I promise you those fish are effervescent. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're literally um, sort of glowing on the canvas and it raises the, raises the hair on the back of your neck. Um, I was standing uh, in front of another painting, another N.C. Wyeth painting, um, some years later, um, in a conservation lab called Island Funeral, um, which used to be at the Hotel DuPont um, in the dining room. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it there, but it's now at the Brandy Wine Museum, thankfully, from 1939. And I was standing in front of this painting with a different conservator, and I said, well, it's positively glowing. It's, it's also effervescent. There's something you know, very, very extraordinary about this painting. And uh, a fellow's name was Stefano Scarfetta. And Stefano leaned back um, and said, well, it might be glowing. Uh, he said, you know, he used to use radioactive paint. Um, <laughs> so N.C. Wyatt, who, of course, was painting you know, right in the catchment of the DuPont Corporation, just north of Wilmington, Delaware, often used experimental pigments. Um, and there were uh, apparently a number of different pigments that were kind of hot to the, hot to the conservator's touch, if you will. I don't think either of these paintings actually were in that case, but I always thought that was uh, sort of a fun, fun little backstory. And there's a little method to my madness. Remember in a few minutes, experimental pigments, because we're going to come back, come back to that. Um, this, to my mind, is probably one of N.C. Wyeth's um, masterpieces. Again, this is one of those terms we weren't supposed to use in graduate school. Um, it's all interesting if you get a PhD. Um, but in this case, this is one of those paintings that does seem to be first among um, equals. Um, obviously, a, a fisherman has drowned, and this is the, you know, the funeral. And all of the other um, people of the coast of Maine are, are coming to pay pay their respects to the lost um, the lost fishermen, and that's one of these you know time honored almost biblical themes that shows up in the work of both uh, Homer but also N. C. Wyeth. Um, so N. C. Wyeth's debt to Homer, I, I, I think we've 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 covered in his kind of interest in, in the state of Maine, which is really uh, all um, all encompassing, and and it's also something that I'd like to point out um, that N.C. Wyeth uh, really inculcated in the um, uh, worldview of his son, um, Andrew Wyeth. A uh, number of years ago, I worked on the restoration of Winslow Homer's studio, and we had the, um, the guest books. So people would come visit um, Homer's studio, because it was owned by um, uh, actually his great nephew, his nephew and then his great nephew, uh, after he died. And they kept these guest books. Uh, and I was reading them uh, through the 1930s just to kind of see, well, who's showing up um, at Proud's Neck, who's paying homage to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to Winslow Homer. And I found uh, N.C. Wyeth and Andrew Wyeth repeatedly coming to Winslow Homer's studio to stand in the painting room, to stand on the rocks. So there was something very, uh, very, very uh, specific about this. Not only did they name their own house Eight Bells after the Homer painting, but they repeatedly visited Homer's house um, on the way to their house um, by um, at Port, um, Port Clyde. Andrew Wyeth um, was um, eldest son of uh, N.C. Wyeth. Um, Andrew Wyeth uh, 
Um, uh, you know, if, if you were to kind of believe the, the PR um, on, uh, that the family put out in the 1940s, emerged kind of fully fledged uh, as, a, as an artist, um, you know, literally from his you know, mother's womb. Um, but we know that Andrew Wyeth uh, studied very, very closely at uh, his father's um, feet um, in Chatsford, um, Pennsylvania, um, in that sort of Brandywine Valley uh, tradition. Very, very interesting how Andrew Wyeth kind of explodes on the scene during World War II in a series of exhibitions at the Museum uh, of, of Modern Art. Um, Andrew Wyeth goes from being, you know, sort of the little-known son of an illustrator to all of a sudden being um, in uh, exhibitions uh, at MoMA. Um, Winter Fields, Andrew Wyeth, it's a collection of the Whitney from 1942. Um, again, a uh, very early effort on the part uh, of uh, Andy Wyeth, and also showing this kind of peculiar um, perspective that we've been um, sort of working on talking about. Um, does anyone remember seeing this? We had this painting as well at our, at our... Did you ever, did you sort of, again, I keep making these funny gestures, but did you try to bring the painting into the picture plane? You're always kind of doing this knee bend, um, because it's very, very hard to make it, you know, where, where are you? It's literally the worm's eye view, kind of below the dead crow looking up on the hill. It's really an extraordinary composition um, in this uh, time period. Um, I always take a little sidebar just to kind of explain the weird world of museums and kind of the gossipy <coughs> nature of what we do. Um, and I always feel the need to give a shout out to the director of the Whitney Museum, Adam Weinberg, um, who's one of the most collegial fellows on the face of the earth. We needed this painting for our exhibition, and the Whitney was touring this in a kind of greatest hits of the Whitney show while they were under construction. He actually pulled the painting from their tour and sent it to us, um, sending another painting to make up the numbers with the other museum. It was an extraordinary gesture on his part. He's one of the very few directors that if you come up with a good idea and you make the case, he will like, turn his institution on its head um, to make sure you get the loan. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very fond of this painting as a result of, of that, um, that circumstance. But again, Andy Wyeth um, shows up 1943, literally on the wall of the Museum of Art, Modern Art um, during the course of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the war. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. But he shows up you know, having thoroughly uh, imbibed or thoroughly internalized his father's interest in how you move your the eye around the canvas and this sort of unusual sense of perspective. Um, this kind of looking up, looking down, dizzying notion, you see it in winter um, from 1945. This is at the North Carolina Museum of Art. I think you can begin to see the Christina's World perspective here, where this little boy is literally just kind of tilt-a-whirl down, um, down the side of this um, mountain. And, and I want to just stop for a few moments and really kind of talk about the background to this, um, this perspective a little bit, this kind of dizzying sense, because it's really quite unusual. Um, if we think about how we are trained in the Western tradition to think about landscape, a lot of it has to do with um, Claude Lorraine, um, French 17th century draftsman um, and painter. Um, this is a classic painting, this is at the net, um, called Sunrise, um, from the very early part of the 17th century, and, and you, you kind of understand the, uh, the way that you're looking through the, the, the narrative and the foreground, and then there's this middle landscape of trees, and you see the, the, you know, the mountains off the background. Um, Lorraine's work, um, many of you probably know, was collected avidly in England um, in the 18th and 19th century. British country houses are filled um, with these. Um, do people know about Claude glasses? As, as English folks would wander around the landscape, they would actually put on um, sort of these glasses that had a slight tint to them and would throw your eye a little bit out of focus so you would see the very landscape as if it was a Claude Lorraine painting. <laughs> um, and I think that's kind of a wonderful take on, what do we call them, Google glasses today? You know, the fact that we have this you know, um, alternate reality. Um, on, the, uh, on the, the digital world today, the fact that tourists in, let's say, 1830 in Great Britain were um, looking at the Cotswolds through Claude glasses um, is kind of wonderful. But, but for the most part, we're, we're 
you know, really trained to look up at a mountain from a distance, and the activity is supposed to be in the foreground, and then you have something in the middle, middle landscape to draw your eye, and the mountains in the background. You can invert that a little bit over time. Um, Thomas Cole, uh, the Oxbow, again at the Met, 1836, an Englishman who comes uh, to America, um, and really is heir to the, you know, the British landscape um, and introduces it to America. There was an interesting exhibition just last year um, at, um, at the Met. You know, for my whole career, we've been you know, discussing Thomas Cole as the most distinctly American painter imaginable, father of the Hudson River School, and of course now we've decided he's really a British painter. Um, and we should put him back in the context of the Atlantic Rim. Um, um, but what I think is interesting um, in this case is we're looking down. Um, we're looking, you know, down from on high, we're looking down from that blasted tree trunk. Um, you know, maybe there's an argument to be made that, you know, looking from on high down at something is kind of an American way of looking, uh, looking at the world, looking at the landscape. Um, I guess I would push this a little farther, so maybe some religious undertones in the earliest years of the New Republic were grasping at straws to create a kind of ancestry for this brand new republic. Um, so the classical, neoclassical past becomes important um, to the country. The you know, interest in Native Americans becomes very important, back to Mr. Cooper and Leatherstocking Tales and all those things at NCY. So there's this sense that you need sort of a grounding, or this religiosity, the fact that this is you know, a city on a hill, we're up high, we're looking down, um, that we have a kind of a mission here in this country, you know, can perhaps be seen in something like Thomas Cole. But, Fundamentally, I want you to take away from this that for hundreds of years, we're either looking up at a mountain from far away or we're looking down um, from the, uh, the mountain here. Um, but what we're not doing is sort of tripping ourselves down the hill in this dizzying perspective that you see in the wilds. Um, now, also on the eve of World War II, um, you know, I would bring up something like Grant Wood's Spring Turning. This is at Rinalda House in Winston-Salem, North Carolina from 1936. Um, what happened nine years before this painting? 1927? Almost, 1929. Two years before the stock market crashed? Prohibition. Prohibition, sure. I'm being unfair, I'm sorry. Tonight. Charles Lindbergh flies across the Atlantic and everyone loses their gourd. <laughs> over the idea of airplanes and aviation and the view from on high. We have fundamentally moved off the farm into cities. We are taking elevators up to the 30th floor. We're looking down. This whole kind of modern concept of looking down, of this view from on high, is really on, on high relief in, in Great Wood, where he has literally just abstracted these fields out in the Midwest into shapes um, and uh, and uh, this, you know, this idea that you know, the, the country can be understood as a series of geometric shapes from on high is, I think, also very important to thinking about where we're going next with Andrew Wyeth um, and then eventually um, his son. I mentioned um, that Andy Wyeth, born in 1917, um, dies just a nine years ago, actually, in 2009, it's surprising, um, uh, emerges almost fully fledged um, you know, in a series of articles and a series of exhibitions um, during the war. Um, this is the study for Soaring, the painting at Shelburne Museum. Um, it's a, a large-scale cartoon, so he, he drew this quite big. It's in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that he's gridded it off for transfer to the, um, to the panel that he paints the, um, paints the painting on. Um, and he's painting this in 1940, excuse me, he's sketching this in 1943. Um, and I think this is an extremely important uh, moment to think about this um, painting. Um, uh, because, of course, we are right in the midst of perhaps the greatest conflict um, the world has known since you know, we talked about Homer and the, and the Civil War. This is the finished painting, of course, at Shelburne Museum. Um, and um, lots of stories. Uh, about this uh, painting, um, some of them quite humorous. Uh, Jamie Wyeth told me the story that his father uh, took this in 1944 to his grandfather, 
uh, N.C. Wyeth at the end of his life and showed it to him. And N.C. Wyeth said, oh, Andy, that'll never make a painting. Um, so Jamie put it face down on um, sawhorses and used it as a, um, a train board um, for O-gauge trains. So he ran, his, he ran his toy trains on the back of it. Um, that's, you know, an amusing uh, tale. Andrew Wyeth didn't let this out of his studio until 1950. Um, and again, I want to kind of come back to the, you know, this moment, 1943 until 1950. It wasn't seen in public until 1950. So again, several of you I know were, were there in the, this time period. The rest of us have heard this from our, our parents. If you can just kind of imagine the imagery that is all around in this time period, um, from the Spanish Civil War through World War II, you know, the concept that we've literally, you know, militarized the air um, itself. Um, first in tactical bombing with these little German planes, um, Stukas, uh, in the early days, which would have been throughout visual culture in newsreels of the early days of World War II, and then eventually to the strategic bombing at the end of the war, which would have come up in you know, the cover of Life magazine, B-29s over Formosa. Um, and of course, it was from a B-29 um, that the atomic bomb was dropped. So when we think about this painting again with these scavenging turkey buzzards over that little lonely farmhouse um, in Pennsylvania in Chad's Ford, I, I don't think it is too much of a leap to say this has something to do with the conversation about the war or the Cold War um, because the tensions that would have been felt by almost every American in the late 1940s would have just been throughout um, society, and this is clearly <coughs> something that runs right, runs rampant um, in this uh, in this painting. Um, so it becomes another one of these paintings that begins to take the hair up on the back of back of your neck when you uh, when you look at it. There's another theme besides extreme perspective at work here, um, and that's the. Uh, the ego of the artist. Um, N.C. Wyeth didn't want to be an illustrator. He wanted to be a landscape painter, and he wanted to be Winslow Homer. He wanted to be compared to Winslow Homer. Winslow Homer didn't want to be a commercial artist. He wanted to be a painter of these essential truths of time um, by painting these rocks at Proud's neck. Uh, Andy Wyeth didn't want to be illustrating magazine covers, and this is the last one he did, The Hunter. Um, in 1943. So as he emerged uh, in uh, visual culture, as he emerged in these exhibitions um, at the Museum of Modern Art, he was in two of them in 43 and 44, which is why I keep bringing them up, um, he issued commercial work, and this was the last one, it was a cover of a magazine. Um, again, it shows this wonderful kind of swirling vertiginous perspective. You see the debt that he owed to his father, and that plate that we looked at initially, the fact that we're up in this tree and we're kind of almost caught in these cyclone limbs moving around, which all takes us down to the, the man with the, uh, the, man with the uh, uh, red hat on and the shotgun. So it's, it's really all about uh, you know, these, this sort of foreboding nature, if you will, of the hunter down on the ground, but contextualized in this autumnal, autumnal scene. But I think it's interesting that this, this kind of Concept that you're, you know, you're you're moving in a direction of being a, a you know an artist in a modernist sense runs throughout um, the visual culture of this of this time period. Um, all of which brings us to the third generation um, and Jamie Wyeth. Uh, and Jamie Wyeth was someone who, in fact, uh, never really needed to work as a uh, as an illustrator like his father and his grandfather. Um, by the time he emerges. He was born in 1946, so right after his, uh, his um, grandfather's death. By the time he emerges, I would argue it's really quite heroic of him to uh, step into the family business. Um, because his father and grandfather were really quite well known um, by this uh, time period. Um, this is the Islander from 1975. And, and Wyeth, Jamie Wyeth, excuse me, I shouldn't, shouldn't use the shorthand. Um, Jamie Wyeth emerges in the early 1970s with a series of these kind of avatars, these animals, which are um, standing in for, for humans. There's a the great pig painting that, that caught uh, everyone's attention. Um, and then I, I'm very, very fond of the islander um, here. 
Um, has anyone ever seen an image of Jamie Wyeth? Kind of have a sense of what Jamie looks like? I think this is a self-portrait. Um, he has a kind of woolly countenance, um, and I think this is, you know, clearly his his you know homage to these islands and these people off off the coast coast of Port Clyde that he knows um, so very um, very well. But this is a, an early um, Jamie. Again, this sort of view from on high and this kind of dizzying, dizzying perspective. Um, Comet from 1997. Um, took me a little while to realize why it was called Comet. Um, a little hard to see. So it is a comet in the sky. Um, this is on the little island that Jamie owns off of Port Clyde. That's, that's his lighthouse. Um, and again, I, I always look at these, these echoes of his father's work and his grandfather's um, work. His grandfather, of course, who took the family to the coast of Maine and you know, taught them to love the, that part of the world. And then his father, who really um, uh, was um, you know, almost his debut painting, was that, that dead crow in the field, that sort of worm's eye view up over the crow in this case. Um, Jamie has transposed it or transcribed it to the, to the seagulls, in this case, looking up the side, side of, his, um, of his lighthouse. Uh, I mentioned his grandfather liked to fool around with um, experimental pigments. His father, of course, painted an egg tempera, um, and I should have mentioned that a little bit earlier on. You know, that's also kind of a contrary thing to be doing in the 1940s, um, to take up a historic, uh, you know, media in the course of egg temper. That's something that a you know, Renaissance artist would have been doing, not a modern artist um, in this uh, time period. Um, this is Berg um, by Jamie Wyeth. And here you see his lighthouse again, his house in the background on his island. Um, Berg is kind of a resonant painting for me. I, I listened to Jamie tell a story once where he talked about um, he was in fairly self-deprecating mode. And he said, well, I've it's never been a fairly talented with a boat. And, you know, one day it was kind of cold out and I needed to go back to the mainland. Um, and he actually fell out of his boat. Um, and, and he claims that he saw this scene while he was in the water, which is, you know, this translucence of these sea cakes, they're cold in that part of Maine, where this is, you know, underwater. And when you're kind of looking up above, you, you get the, the more um, opaque view of these little chunks of ice, but when you're looking, when you're in the water itself, which must have been thoroughly terrifying, you can actually kind of see the translucent part. Um, these are called sea cakes because they're, they're literally born in the brackish water of marshes up rivers, um, so, and then they kind of break up and they flow down river into the, into the ocean, so they have a peculiar sort of buoyancy um, to them as they go out, uh, go out um, to sea. Um, this was another painting that we had. This is from 2011 at the, uh, in the exhibition at Shelburne Museum. I was only a couple years old at that point when we, uh, when we did the show. Um, but when you stood in front of that painting, that translucence, you know, that, that painting actually kind of made you feel cold. There was a kind of a peculiar you know, visceral response you had to it. Um, and there again, I happened to be talking to an art conservator uh, at that moment, Nancy Rapinel. Um, and she said, oh, well, you know what he's doing there, don't you? And I said, no. She said, he's just taking um, these uh, varnishes, acryloid, um, solubar, B72. It's, it's a, just a kind of a standard clear varnish. And he's mixing watercolors and all sorts of other paints. And he's making his own paint to create a kind of gummy, jammy, translucent paint to give you that cold blue, that very harsh um, blue. Um, that's why the Wyatts have their own conservators. That's why they have their own staff looking after these paintings, because they are so darn complicated. Um, this is an extremely complicated painting um, to, uh, to, to care for in that regard, because the artist is mixing up his own, um, it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, the equivalent of moonshine. It's, 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 there, there's no, no uh, uh, what are those data sheets you get for paints, the MS something sheets? You know, when you get the actual ingredients of the paint, there are no ingredients for these paintings. Whatever he did that day, um, so it's it's a very unusual way for a painter today to be approaching his art to just kind of make his uh, make it up as he goes with these um, these um, materials. So, an unusual painting, and again, it's inherently unusual um, because of the way he's um, choosing to um, uh, to um, uh, to uh, 
you know, pick and choose and shape and choose of materials in that regard. Um, this all gets us toward you know the end of our story here. Um, Jamie on the right, Andrew on the left. They received honorary doctorates uh, from the University of Vermont sometime in the 1980s. I forgot exactly when, 85, 86, 87. Um, and they did so, I think, because somebody was aware of the fact that we had one of the great paintings here in Vermont. Um, we had soaring at Shelburne Museum. So Andy on the left and Jamie on the right, when they came to pick up their, their hoods, their robes, uh, for, uh, for the commencement, uh, stopped by and we got this PR shot. Um, Jamie, you can see, is tolerating the moment. <laughs> His father, a little less, little less so, uh, on, on the left. But, um, but both, um, uh, you know, very aware of this painting, um, and, um, and I think relatively pleased um, that they were there to visit it at um, Shelburne Museum. And I want to show one last painting, and this again is back to, back to Jamie's Island, that we've seen now a couple of times. Um, and this was a painting that he uh, also painted in 2011. And he, um, he painted it after we told him we were doing the exhibition, Wyeth Vertigo. Um, and when I had a chance to talk about this work with him a little bit later on, he said, well, you know, this was my version of soaring. This was my version of my father's painting. Because um, his father painted those turkey buzzards over Chad's Ford before he'd ever been up in an airplane. And he just imagined himself in his mind's eye above those buzzards, above that farmhouse, above that landscape. Um, and J.D. sort of internalized that perspective, that question of how do you hover over your landscape that you know so well. And in this case, he hovered over his house in a storm that you see here, and he painted an homage to Soaring. Um, it's called Spindrift. Um, I'm very touched by this painting. Um, in my line of work, you don't always um, give an artist you know, a reason to paint something. Um, you don't always provide an idea or a spark. Um, and I'm sort of touched that the, the exhibition that we did at Shelburne Museum caused Jamie to go paint this homage um, to his dad um, and to the painting that's at um, Shelburne Museum. So, what I hope we take away from this, this evening, is um, Andy Wyeth, Andrew Wyeth, who was probably the artist the critics loved to hate in the 1940s and 50s, and the more the critics didn't like him, the more the rest of us did, <laughs> because somehow or other he was putting his finger on and illustrating the essential truth, um, and he learned that way of illustrating these essential truths of life from his father, N.C. Wyeth, literally at his father's knee in the Brandywine Valley of Pennsylvania with other artists who were coming to study. Um, and his father was fascinated by Winslow Homer and taught his son to appreciate Winslow Homer. And Winslow Homer, again, was the fellow who said we should all pay very, very close attention to nature um, and we should eschew the kind of the trappings of worldly life um, to be so so focused on our muse that you would create paintings that hang on the walls of museums from coast to coast. And, and from that kind of agar, or from that soup, um, we get Jamie Wyeth, who to this day uh, is someone who interprets the coast and the people of Maine um, in you know, new and sophisticated each ways each time. But what I, what I want us all to take away from this is a little more than just Christina's world as a postage stamp or Christina's world as something that's perhaps so familiar to us that it's a little hackneyed, and understand that there's a great deal of complexity to the Wyeths, um, and this idea of extreme perspective that we're always looking up, we're looking down, and we're always kind of back on our heels socially when we're talking to them, or visually when we're looking at their, uh, looking at their paintings, um, is something that's really kind of the, the gift that they gave to us. Um, as a as a family. Thank you. I don't have to be at work till nine. So we can we can we can talk about anything. But tomorrow. <laughs> I've uh, been to his home on, on Monhegan, 
Is that what you meant? No. His home on Monhegan, very interesting question, is actually Rockwell Kent's house. Yes, I knew that too. So, uh, and that's, you know, part of this sort of, if his father performed this kind of, you know, what do you call it, filial piety or something to Winslow Homer, Jamie went and bought Rockwell Kent's house and restored it. It's that same sort of very aware of where do they fit in the tradition of artists who came to the coast coast of Maine. Um, no, it's it's another little island right off the mouth of Port Clyde, um, which is where he spends. He um, he leaves Monhegan when the tourists show up. Um, yeah. And um, has anyone been to Monhegan? People been to Monhegan? You know, there are a couple of pickup trucks on Monhegan that, that that's all they have there. So you get, you stay at the hotel, the pickup truck gets your luggage, takes it up, you know, to your room. And there are always these college students who are driving the pickup trucks. And the first thing they're taught is if you see a cardboard box on the side of the road, don't hit it. Because Jamie Wyeth is sitting in the box painting. Um, he uses them as little kind of shelters. We talked about clawed glasses before. He, he used to use them to kind of frame the view. He would get an old refrigerator box or something. And everyone on the island was afraid that, you know, some college boy was going to take them out um, with one of these rusty old pickup trucks. So, but there are very there are a number of Wyeth properties all around you know Port Clyde. Yeah. You know. What's the connection between the Brandywine Valley and the Maine coast? Very good question. Um, Brandywine Valley, north of Wilmington, Delaware, is where they settled um, and where they kept their house in the um, um, winter time. It's often called the Brandywine School of Illustrators. I elided right over all of this, but Frank Schoonover and Peter Hurd and all these other illustrator artists all studied under N.C. Wyeth in the Brandywine um, Valley uh, in that time period. Um, is there a more um, elaborate or con connection? I don't think so, other than N.C. Wyeth was fascinated by Winslow Homer and wanted to go you know, compare himself to Winslow Homer, so he, he, he traveled to Maine. Very typical for artists to do that in the time period. Um, I was looking in some records at the Archives of American Art in Washington, and uh, Walt Kuhn and a number of artists all went on these pilgrimages to Winslow Homer's studio. It was, he was, you know, it was the sort of thing one did as an artist in the 19 teens through 30s and 40s. How did uh, the Wyeths get tied? Uh, to the Scribner publisher. I should know that, and I don't. Other than he was, he was in fact, you know, publishing in all of these illustrated magazines from uh, 1890s on. Probably from Pyle. So Howard Pyle is another. Yeah. So there, are, there are all of these set of illustrators who would have been. What, what I meant is, it looked like Scribner would be looking among many applicants. For that, to find that one that position, that one analogy. Yeah. Do you actually? Sounds like just because he was studying with Pyle, and all of his students were selling things at the same time to New York City publishing. Yeah. They were all going up from Delaware to the city, and yeah. their sketches and saying, "I'm from Pyle School. This is what I have." Yeah. It's probably the. I think that's as good a. <laughs> it would have been. Um, you know, if you're if you think about the kind of the rise of publishing and commercial publishing in this era, you would you know you would naturally look to a certain you know certain school. It, it's actually an interesting question. I was thinking about this a little while ago. We've lost touch with regional culture a little bit in this country when it comes to where you used to find professional um, help. You know, if you weren't living in New York. Um, and you were, let's say you lived in North Carolina, you would go to Baltimore for your doctors, Philadelphia for your architect, New York for your wife's dresses. I mean, there are all these kind of, these places you used to look to for, you know, centers of professional culture. Um, and, you know, exactly, the Brandywine School would have been, well, we need illustrations. So there's this guy producing students, that's where you would go. It wasn't, it, we didn't have a menu of places you would go to find illustrators in that time period. They were coming from a specific place. I don't know if that made any sense, mm -hmm. but. I'm intrigued with this painting. The rock-bound coast. 
Yes. And the water itself is so precise. Yes. And yet the the two uh, things on the grass. The structures, yeah. Yes. Uh, is almost, almost hazy. Yes. Is there some specific reason? That I I think he's probably trying to create or capture some of the atmosphere. This apparently was a heck of a storm. <laughs> um, and I'll creep up gently on telling this story. Um, at the end of his life, David Rockefeller came up to Shelburne, and I showed him this exhibition. Um, we walked through it, um, and he looked at this painting, and he said, oh, you know, we, we tried to land my boat in that storm to have lunch with Jamie, and they almost wouldn't let me... You know, they wouldn't let him off the boat. They were worried about his, you know, literally his life coming on and off. And he said, and he, he kind of said, it was a hell of a storm. You know, so it's, it, you know, and, you know, literally, you know, that was from the mouth of David Rockefeller. So. How large is that painting in real life? 28 by 30. It's not very big. Yeah. And where is that now? Still in his hand, in his, you know. I tried to talk him into leaving it with us. <laughs> that didn't go very far. Be more persuasive. Um, is the house in Christina's World the same house in, as in Soaring? No, I'm sorry. Christina's World is the house in um, Maine. It's the Olson house. And Soaring's um, the neighbor's house, Kerner's Farm. Or the farm even beyond Kerner's Farm in Chatsport. Um, if people are traveling down through down 95, it's well worth going to the Brandywine Museum. And they have both Andy Wyeth and NC Wyeth Studios open now. Um, Andrew Wyeth's fairly recently. Very interesting to see. Um, I showed that sketch or that cartoon for story that was gridded off. There actually aren't that many Andrew Wyeth drawings you know, out on the market. And I learned when I went to the studio why. He kept a 55-gallon drum outside of his studio, and he burned them. Because um, he didn't think um, they were, you know, the process wasn't as important to him as the, the final painting. Um, and there was the burn barrel outside of the studio. And everyone in Chad's Ford knew what he was doing. It's, it's really very interesting to me. All the neighbors knew how he's burning his sketches. And today, we, yeah. My lord, but yeah, no different different landscape. One one is Pennsylvania, one is Maine. We do have at the museum right now um, New England Now, the exhibition up right now, and we have a photographer from Maine who did a little rephotographic survey of the Olson House. So here's my shameless plug: go go see that <laughs> see that exhibition and see if you can recognize the Olson House on the on the wall. So. Biographical question about Andrew. Did he serve in World War II? No. Um, he was busy doing exhibitions at MoMA. Um, and MoMA actually took it as um, part of their uh, service to the war effort to do a series of projects that explored what it was to be American. Um, and very interesting, there was a show called Realism and Magical Realism. Super Realism? Magical Realism. Um, in 1944. Um, and the lengths, Lincoln Kirstein, who wrote the, the essay in the front of this catalog, the lengths Lincoln Kirstein went to go to to avoid any Germans in the discussion of the development of abstraction is incredible. So in fact, he then goes back and claims all of these ancestors for modern painters in figures like Winslow Homer and others, um, and doesn't want anything to do with, you know, German abstraction from the early part of the uh, early part of the 20th century in 1943, 1944. Yeah. Uh, Andrew's sisters who painted yes. their perspective work. Yeah, very good point. Um, uh, one of them actually was his sister who said, "We all paint, even the dogs," <laughs> uh, and they are completely subsumed in the slightly macho narrative of of the Wyatt um, family. So his sister married um, uh, Peter Hurd, uh, who was a student of N.C. Wyatt. 
Um, we did have a couple of his sister's paintings in the Vertigo show a couple of years ago. Um, very moody, very interesting. Um, but they do get they do get sort of lost in the, the larger narrative of the family. Not terribly um, surprising given the way the kind of image of the artist is portrayed in the course of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, you know, women, women get left out of this story and many others in the public sphere. What are the titles of the books you wrote about bias? What are the names of the books you wrote? Oh, I, well, I helped out on the catalog Wyeth Vertigo, um, um, but I have more often than not written on Winslow Homer. Oh, I so, a book called Weather Beaten, a little book called Winslow Homer and the Poetics of Faith. So, in case you couldn't tell, I know more about Homer than I do Wyeth. <laughs> Andrew Wyeth had a tremendous ability to capture the real world that he was walking around in and picturing it. Uh, you said that he burned a lot of his drawings. Did he have a sketchbook, sketchbooks, photography? How was he doing his study and remembrance? It's a good question. I think he's sketching. Um, I don't remember. Um, I don't remember much discussion of photography with any of the the wives. Um, NC, they all like photographers. They all like having their picture taken. <laughs> They're very good at you know projecting a you know an image, a public image as an artist. Um, but I I'd have to put an asterisk down on that because just when I get comfortable saying you know their relationship with photography wasn't quite what I think it was, then it turns out they were avid photographers. <laughs> there was an exhibition it's up right now at the Brandywine Museum. Um, it was at Bowdoin this last summer called Winslow Homer and the Camera. And I'm supposed to know something about Winslow Homer, and I knew he had a camera, and I knew he was interested in photography, but I completely missed how um, indebted he was to his hobby of photography. Um, and um, the relationship between painters and photographers is really quite vexed in the late 19th century. Um, photographers, for the most part, uh, were you know camera operators from the invention of photography in 1839 until really the turn of the century when there are storied battles for um, respect and over the question of is photography an art or a, uh, or, you know, a craft in some way. You know, camera operator is very much like steam engine operator. It's, it's, it's not in, imbuing the photographer with a, a status um, that you see. And most of the amateur photography uh, journals of the late 19th century did not help the, the situation because they basically made it something that dentists would be doing. Um, you know, this, is a, this is a therapeutic hobby, this isn't a, an art form to be taken seriously. So um, in places like Philadelphia where you get um, you know, doctors and artists you know, cheek by jowl literally in life classes together, in anatomy classes together where science and art is really you know, kind of in one one bucket. Um, even there, you have um, you know Thomas Aikens, who was kind of you know never going to admit he was a photographer, um, and she would you know take a photograph, grid it off, and transfer it to a to a painting. It wasn't until a few years ago there's a brilliant exhibition, Aikens and the Camera, that shows just how influenced he was by photography, um, and that's what they just did with Homer um, more more recently. So it's it's kind of the dirty secret of emerging modernist painters if they were interested in photography. The model for Christina's Rural, I guess that was her real name. Wasn't it? Christina Olson, yeah. Christina Olson. She was handicapped and she used to move around by crawling. She led an extremely challenged life. Um, I'm not quite sure I know if we know what, what the diagnosis was, but she was basically paralyzed um, and um, lived with her brother in the old farmhouse and would kind of lift herself around. She wouldn't use a wheelchair, um, wouldn't use anything that would, and so she would, she would kind of just, you know, by sheer muscle kind of herk herself around. Um, 
It was apparently almost squalor that they lived in in the house. And I think it was sort of Andy Wyatt kind of performing this role of being an iconoclast that he befriended them. Um, that, you know, even other neighbors were kind of standoffish with the Olsons because they were complicated. Knowing that yeah. gives me a, a different feeling about that pain because there's a great distance to the house from where she is. It's a little frightening. She has to crawl all the way up yeah. the hill. Yeah. So that's her world of crawling up to wherever she needs to get there. Yeah. I think she used to crawl around in the garden to do all of the garden work. And put yourself, if we went back to it, put yourself in Andrew Wyatt's perspective. And back to that last question, he's not taking a picture of her. You know, he's, he's there having coffee with the family. He may be sketching her. He may be lying in the grass next to her, which is something that he was, you know, want to do. We were told when we visited the Olsen house that he was looking out the window upstairs. A lot of the rooms are actually become paintings, but he was looking at the uh, window and looked down at he her. He saw her. Yeah. And saw her. And that's yeah. what he got this. Yeah. He sketched out that yeah. position and used it in the painting. Yeah. Remember, too, soaring. You know, he, he sketched that painting before he'd ever been in an airplane. So he, he was quite, quite adept at um, you know, transposing himself above and under scenes. Now, it's a very good point. Um, they very much kind of cleaned up the story of Christina at, at the Olsen house. Because um, it, it, it seems like she led a very hard life. Are there any more Wyatts coming up after? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, after Jamie? <coughs> Not that I'm aware of. Um, he's got a wonderful niece, Vic, Victoria. Um, yeah, she came and gave a talk um, at the museum when we had the show. Up. Um, she's a psychologist. So. She's got a lot to work with. She's got a, she's got a, she's got a whole lot to work with. I'm kind of a, a more upbeat note, maybe, when I was at the museum in Brandywine Museum. There is a wonderful book of Jamie Wyatt's dog paintings. Uh, well, it is the most charming, engaging. I bought it for everyone that Christmas, <laughs> you know, who's a dog lover. Um, you know, some famous dogs and, and owners. Um, he, really charming. Janie has a way of, you know, anthropomorphizing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sort of imbuing these animals with a, you know, a degree of you know, our, our kind of emotional sensibility, which is, even, which is really quite lovely. Um, so. Wonderful. It's a paperback. Yeah. <laughs> For anyone of us, you know, dog lovers, and you need a gift for for Christmas or for holidays. Many, many, many years ago, I worked for a, a great director who was an authority on Dutch, seven, Dutch 17th century painting. And, you know, Vermeer is obviously the name we know, but Peter de Hoek is sort of the junior varsity Dutch uh, still life painter of the 17th century. And I don't know how many de Hoeks are known, like 80? Not that many. 78 of them have dogs in them, and they are wonderful. And I kept wandering around saying, we really ought to do DeHoke's dogs, you know, because DeHoke painted dogs like you wouldn't believe. They were just fascinating, um, which is why they didn't let me in that department all that often. Thank you. Thank you.